long before the airplane, they were the undisputed masters of the skies. From simple hot air balloons to flying aircraft carriers, they would prove an elegant dead end in military aviation. Learn the secrets of their demise through remarkable underwater discoveries and experience their revival with modern technology. Their airships, next on Weapons at War. June 26, 1991. The maiden voyage of the Westinghouse Sentinel 1000. With the command up ship, she rises from her launch pad and regains for the airship a mission lost for over 30 years, a military role for lighter than air vehicles. Although airships may be familiar sights as flying billboards and high altitude platforms for television cameras, the Sentinel-1000 carries a complex network of electronic surveillance monitors, radar and communications equipment. Proponents of the airship claim this new weapon is unmatched for range, endurance and lifting capacity. In spite of its modern veneer, at the heart of the Sentinel lies a technology over two centuries old, an idea that sent man aloft more than 100 years before the flight of Orville and Wilbur Wright. There is something about an airship flying through the sky that attracts the attention of the viewers below. An airplane goes by, you don't give it a second thought. But when a blimp goes by, people stop, they pause, they look up, they see it going by. There is the sense of pause in our perception of an airship that says, this cannot be, this is incongruous. A thing of that size cannot hold in the skies. And so you look again just to assure yourself that this is really so. The whole town turned out when they came. You betcha, monsters, you wouldn't believe how big, how long they were. It was very exciting. There's something that big up in the air by itself with men out there running it. Oh. Wonderful, wonderful to see. On June 5th, 1783, two Frenchmen, Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier, launched the first lighter-than-air balloon. The craft was a giant silk and paper bag held airborne by hot smoke. Two months later, a crowd of 50,000 Parisians cheered as Professor Jacques Charles first hydrogen balloon took flight. It got away from them and landed in a village and the peasants thought it was the work of the devil and uh, they attacked it with pitchforks and uh, tore it to pieces. Between the middle of the 19th century and the end of the 19th century, different kinds of people were trying to work out some way in which you could make a balloon dirigible. You could make it steerable. You could apply some power to it so it could move through the air under its own direction. 
the spherical balloon was the simplest to build, but soon aviators recognized that the elongated shape was the easiest to maneuver. In 1901, Alberto Santos Dumont flew his 110-foot gasoline-powered airship in a seven-mile trip from the outskirts of Paris to the Eiffel Tower and back in less than 30 minutes. While Santos Dumont was perfecting his designs in France, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin was pursuing his dream in Germany. As a young army officer, the Count had come to the United States as an observer of the Civil War. It was while witnessing balloons in combat that his fascination with lighter-than-air flight began. Balloons and blimps are non-rigid airships. Zeppelin designed rigid airships. These aircraft were built with an internal metal superstructure. Hydrogen gas was contained in cells inside the structure. From the first flight of his LZ-1 in 1900 to the start of World War I, Count Zeppelin launched 25 different airships. Although most met with disaster, Ferdinand Zeppelin remained committed to his dream of airship travel. In 1909, the Count launched the world's first commercial airline, called Delag. By now, it became a great thing to go up in Zeppelin and see the world around below you and uh, take these kinds of trips. His airships flew over 100,000 miles, carrying more than 37,000 passengers on sightseeing excursions throughout Germany. Zeppelin's work had attracted the attention of the German military. The generals recognized the potential of the airship as the perfect vehicle to initiate a new type of warfare, strategic bombing. In 1915, Germany sent her airships on the first aerial raids against England. This was the first time in the history of mankind that an aerial vehicle had become an instrument of warfare affecting innocent civilians. Over the course of the war, 128 German airships dropped 62 tons of bombs on Russia, 50 tons on neighboring France, and 220 tons on England. The British first began shooting at them with anti-aircraft guns. Obviously, the Zeppelins could easily fly higher than the British could shoot. The British then went after them with fighter aircraft. The fighters carried incendiary bullets because a couple of incendiary bullets hitting an airship and would burst into flame. The airships would defend themselves, a few carried guns, but more, they just went higher because the aircraft engines at the time could not go as high as the airships could. So it became a technological race. The higher the airships were able to rise, the more the airplanes developed an ability to follow them up. In fact, in those last engagements of the year 1918, the Zeppelins had moved to an ultimate height of 22,000 feet. They did kill somewhere between five and 600 men, women, and children, almost all of whom were non-combatants. But still, these Zeppelin trips were very much hit and miss propositions. The German army stopped using Zeppelins in the late winter of 1917. They simply found them too difficult to handle, too unreliable, too open to the um, vagaries of the weather, and uh, not worth the cost and the effort of building, maintaining, stationing, and servicing them. During World War I, the airship proved most successful as a platform for airborne reconnaissance. High above the battle lines, out of range of gunfire, the airships could track enemy movements. German airship captains improvised what was described as the loneliest assignment of the war, observing from the cloud car. The cloud car was a device 
which let the Zeppelin fly very slowly or even hover above the clouds and on a cable lower an observation car below the clouds so that the observer could get the intelligence they wanted, telephone it up through a telephone cable to the airship, or be retracted. As dangerous as it must have been, this job had no shortage of volunteers. The crews relished the chance to drift far below the hydrogen-filled mothership and enjoy a pastime that was strictly forbidden above, smoking a cigarette. The Allies also used airships for reconnaissance during the war. Observers were sent aloft in hydrogen-filled kite balloons to spot for the artillery and track enemy troop movements. We even had balloon corps within armies where people were trained specifically to maintain, operate, go up in balloons, and report by a telephone cable that came down with the cable that winched the balloon up and down, uh, report on enemy troops and enemy movements. They were the eyes of the army in those days. And we had no satellites or high-flying observation aircraft. We had a great regard for them. They were, of course, favorite targets of aircraft. And what happens, the bullet goes through the balloon, and of course the pilot jumped out. The balloon burns inside, and suddenly in a big poof, it just explodes like a, a bag, a paper bag. It, it's scary to see how quick it all happens. The British began rigid airship development late in the war, copying designs from downed German Zeppelins. In 1919, they launched their R-34, powered by five 250-horsepower engines and traveling at a top speed of 63 miles per hour, the R-34 became the first aircraft to make a non-stop transatlantic flight. Its sister ship, the R-33, became the first airship to carry an airplane from the ground and launch it in flight. In 1925, an accident on its mooring mast proved the value of gas cell design of rigid airships. Even with extensive damage to its nose, the R-33 landed safely. In the late 1920s, the British introduced original designs not based on the Zeppelins the enormous R-100 and R-101. But in 1930, the R-101 exploded in a storm. The R-100 was soon grounded and sold as scrap, ending the British rigid airship program. Rigid airship development took a different but tragic course in the United States. Today, the only reminder of the giant American airships are the hangars which once housed them. One in Lakehurst, New Jersey, and another in Sunnyvale, California. Looming 200 feet above the surrounding landscape, these metal caverns dwarf the plains of today. But at one time, they were just large enough to accommodate the airships of the US Navy, and with them, the dream of American military, eyes in the sky. This dream started at the end of World War I. With the Germans vanquished, America now faced a potential new threat, the Japanese Navy. To counter this threat would require new measures as anticipated in a war document known as Plan Orange. Constructed around the idea of a huge fleet battle between the U.S. and Japanese navies, it motivated planners to request airships. The hope was to develop an aerial scouting capability for the Navy. America embarked on a program to build a rigid airship of its own, based on plans drawn up from an outdated German Zeppelin forced down in France during the First World War. The finished product, while not revolutionary in performance, lived up to its planners' expectations and gave the U.S. its first experiments with airship operations. The Shenandoah brought America into airship operations, and it seemed that we were on our way to a true lighter-than-air arm for the Navy. More ships were needed. 
Ironically, the next airship delivered to the Navy would come from an old enemy. Germany was no longer allowed to uh, build their own rigid airships by the Allies, and so the Zeppelin company was really out of business, except that they owed the United States an airship, and that turned into the Los Angeles. Delivered across the Atlantic, filled with potentially explosive hydrogen gas, the Los Angeles was slated to be filled instead with helium. Unfortunately, the Navy had only enough helium for one airship. The answer? Hang the Shenandoah in the hangar and pump its gas into the Los Angeles. This began a series of remarkable test flights in the safest airship the U.S. ever owned. Still, it was subject to the whims of the weather, the only real enemy a peacetime dirigible faced. It wasn't as rigid as you might think. The Los Angeles used to get out over the North Atlantic occasionally, and uh, we'd hit some wild weather up there sometimes and uh, uh, with winds and stuff, and it would, it would bend. You could see it, it, it moving. Uh, other than that, the storms are, well, we didn't fly normally in storms if we could help it. After these trials, it was time for an overhaul, and the helium was pumped back into the Shenandoah. Gliding over Ohio early on a September morning in 1925, the Shenandoah was overcome by a storm. After a brutal beating, the airship could no longer take the stress and began to break up. By 5.30 that morning, she was a tangle of aluminum and canvas in an open field, and 14 of the Navy's best airshipmen were dead. To replace the Shenandoah, the Navy decided to build two huge airships as naval scouts for the American fleet. They would be bigger, better, and much more expensive than anything previously attempted in naval aviation. At a time when a large airplane could be built for thousands of dollars, the USS Akron was built at a cost of over five million. But when it was finished, it was the largest and most advanced airship the world had seen. She seemed invincible, but was as fragile as any airship. Made of miles of dura aluminum girder formed from metal scarcely thicker than the bottom of a soft drink can, she was covered with thin cotton cloth. First it was doped, and it was clear dope until it, it drawed up tight, and then, then an aluminum pigment uh, covering was put on it to where you got that silvery look on the outside of it. Still, the Akron was a technological marvel. The airship's power plants, eight German-built Maybach V-12 engines, were contained in the hull where they could be worked on during flight with relative comfort. The axles of the drive shafts, which powered the propellers, could be oriented in a number of directions, giving the Akron the ability to maneuver as no other airship of its time. To replace the weight of fuel as it was consumed, huge condensers drew water from the engine exhaust to maintain ballast. An airship was a complicated machine, more akin to a sailing ship in the sky than like the early airplanes with which it competed. And it was run like a ship too, with a large crew trained for the many complex procedures. The ship was commanded like an ocean-going ship, not like, a, like an aircraft is where you have a pilot and co-pilot. The, the captain would command the ship. There would be a rudderman, and someone else would control the elevation. Machinist mates and that would maintain the engines, and that way it was very different than aircraft. Landing the huge craft was also complicated and required a still larger crew. If we drop a line first from up in the bow, uh, ground crews would take, go off in a sort of a V away from it, and uh, then we were low, lower down, the, just lower the ship down. They wouldn't drag us down. They would just sort of help guide it down. When we got it down low enough, well, then uh, we would m walk the ship up to the to the mast then, and then attach the nose comb, and then we just start the engines on the mooring mast, and they'd just walk the ship into the hangar. While the new ship proved itself, a twin giant took shape in Akron, Ohio. She was named Macon. 
With her commissioning in 1933, the Navy's dream of two flying aircraft carriers was at last a reality. The Akron would patrol the Atlantic, the Macon, the Pacific. We intended to use the Akron and Macon as flying aircraft carriers. And the concept developed for them in the 20s and 30s was that these airships would fly ahead of the surface fleet and would periodically launch scouting aircraft that would fan out over the water and look for the enemy fleet to give us early warning of the approach of enemy ships. Then the scout planes would fly back to the Akron and Macon, be recovered, put up in their hangar, and if enemy airplanes try to attack the two airships, they would launch fighter planes, sparrowhawks, the same way to engage and shoot down the enemy fighters. To fulfill the role of scout plane and defensive fighter, the Curtis Wright Sparrowhawk was selected. Chosen primarily for its small size, the Sparrowhawk, unremarkable as a carrier-based plane, seemed well suited to the giant airships. Supported above by a crane, they could be lowered one by one through an opening in the bottom of the hull and from there launched into the air. Like an aircraft carrier, the airship would turn into the wind and the tiny planes would rev their engines as they hung from a metal bar called the trapeze. Barely above stall speed, they would drop when released until they gained sufficient lift to fly their mission. Recovery was the reverse procedure as they flew up to meet the airship. Problems cropped up from time to time and were handled with typical Navy ingenuity. The system was meant to be practical, not elegant. When the airship took off from Moffett, what would happen is the, the planes would stay on the ground and wait till the airship got up to a certain elevation and then um, fly off from Moffett and then attach up onto the mothership. And at that stage, the crew would take the landing gear off the aircraft and attach extra fuel tanks to the Sparehawks to increase their scouting range. At that stage, the Sparehawks were pretty much committed to landing back on the Macon because they had no other place to land. For the first few months of 1933, the Akron was busy with fleet maneuvers and public relations flights. If there was a desperate pace to the schedule, it may have been because the Navy had spent big on its new airships and Congress wanted to see results. Following two fleet exercises, the results were still inconclusive. The big airship was really more of an experimental test bed rather than a proven design, and once again, bad weather intervened. Cruising along the east coast on a clear April night, the Akron was overtaken by the worst storm of 1933. The commanding officer fought long and hard to keep her aloft, but shortly after midnight, gusting wind forced her downward from an altitude of about 1,600 feet until her lower tail fin struck the water. Dropping ballast, she clawed for altitude, but the damage was done. The tail was held fast by the raging sea. Minutes later, the Akron broke up, and by the time rescuers arrived, 72 of 76 crew members were dead. It was a deadly scenario that would become hauntingly familiar to the US Navy. Many of the best airshipmen died in the Akron accident, including a staunch supporter of the program, Rear Admiral William A. Moffett, the head of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics. Only the Macon remained to carry on the case for rigid airships. There was no margin for error, no time for mistakes. She immediately began a series of long-range continental crossings, public relations flights, and fleet exercises. While skepticism in official circles began to cloud the future of the Naval Airship Division, the Macon continued to perform. But in April of 1934, on her way to Florida, the airship was flying over a mountainous region of Texas when she was struck by a gust of wind. This caused damage to a rear fin mount, exposing a weakness which would later prove fatal. Operating off the coast of California, the Macon participated in extensive fleet exercises in February of 1935. The big ship had scored a number of successes against the simulated opponent, and spirits were high. With her four scout planes secured in her belly, Macon made a wide turn 
and headed north to her home at Moffett Field in Sunnyvale, California. Back on February 12th, 1935, when the Macon was trying to reach Moffett Field, they were uh, a few miles from the coastline, and there was a moderate storm off the coast that they were running into. When they started having problems with steering the ship, they deduced that they were losing lift in two helium cells. At that stage, the captain decided to start a series of maneuvers to, to try and stabilize the ship. One of them was to uh, drop some ballast because he lost his lift. So the, the crew was ordered to drop some ballast. They tried to uh, use the dynamic lift of the propellers, and they were configured to try and steer the ship vertically. As the Macon rose above her service ceiling, she began to bleed precious helium. Losing lift, she fell towards the sea, and Commander Wiley ordered the crew forward to prepare to abandon ship. As the ship foundered, the distress calls alerted the nearby fleet, including the cruiser USS Louisville. Radio transcriptions still sound urgent some 60 years later. Following from the Macon, quote, falling, unquote. All ships turn on searchlights and cover assigned sectors. Do not set off rockets or flares. Report direct to the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Fleet. When survivors are picked up, it's always rough off point, sir, but it, it was really rough that day. And all I could think about, those guys falling in the sea, they haven't got a chance. The Navy ships picked up 81 of the 83 crew members, but as the Macon slipped slowly beneath the waves, it signaled the end of the rigid airship in the United States. The ink was still wet in Versailles when the Zeppelin Company was forced to fight for its very existence. But in 1925, the restrictions were finally lifted. The airship makers set out to build another rigid under the leadership of Dr. Hugo Eckner, a dynamic and charismatic man. Money was found, and the airship LZ-127 was built. Named the Graf Zeppelin, by airship standards, it was a luxury liner. But it appeared more like a World War I Zeppelin. It was called the Lucky Airship, but its long history of safe flights had another origin. It was lucky because Dr. Hugo Eckner flew it with absolutely intensive caution. He never risked his airship for anything. He was perfectly willing to be half a day late somewhere if he had to take a course of action that took the ship on a different course because he felt it was the safer thing to do. Under Eckner's able leadership, the Graf Zeppelin covered over a million miles, more than any airship before or since. The Graf Zeppelin made hundreds and hundreds of different trips. Flight to Italy, a flight to Romania, a flight to Bulgaria, a flight to Russia. This is the ship that went all the way around the world in 1929. The round the world flight was Eckner's triumph and the realization of the dreams of the visionary Count Zeppelin. As the Zeppelin company weathered the Great Depression, another giant was taking shape at Friedrichshafen. The Hindenburg was conceived in the fall of 1930 as a successor ship to the Graf Zeppelin. But once again, a key question dogged the designers. To fill the new airship with hydrogen, abundant and cheap, but dangerous, or helium, safe but nearly impossible to get from America, the only source. The Congress had made very stringent laws against the export of helium, except at one cubic foot at a time for scientific experimental purposes. And so the airship flew with hydrogen. 1936 saw the Hindenburg fly to America 10 times and to Brazil six times. The new passenger liner 
began its 1937 season, a commercial success. There are a number of important persons that's on board. Then and chance, aided by the choice of hydrogen for lift, once again intervened. On previous flights, he acted as a chief officer. As the Hindenburg was closing on Lakehurst Naval Air Station on the stormy evening of May 6, 1937, crews of Navy ground handlers over 200 strong ventured into a light misting rain to haul down the great ship. What happened next is seared into the minds of a generation. was a shudder throughout the airship. The crew aft could see the light of spreading flames as over seven million cubic feet of hydrogen began to burn. As the fire grew, the tail of the ship dropped to the ground, enabling a number of people to escape the inferno. Four, five hundred feet into the sky, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen, the smoke and the flames now, and the flames. Finally. The nose section fell, and the ship crashed to Earth. Sixty-two terrified survivors fled from the wreckage. While many theories have been put forward to account for the disaster, few are supported with any real evidence. Sabotage or accident? We will never know. At this moment, another hydrogen-filled ship was cruising a few thousand feet above Europe. It was the lucky ship, the Graf Zeppelin. The news flashed to the ship's captain and was kept from the passengers until landing. Within months, the Graf was retired to a German museum, and the nation that developed the rigid airship moved to conquer Europe. Soon, the airplane would carry the swastika and tons of explosives to new lands. Many believe the fiery crash of the Hindenburg marked the end of the useful life of the airship. But by the end of World War II, more dirigibles were in the air than at any other time in history. Blimps were commissioned by the United States Navy to escort convoys and scout for the German U-boats that were devastating shipping lines. Here, the blimps would serve as long-range eyes for the convoys. And if they spotted a submarine, they would radio to the convoy or the escort commander. To some degree, they were more efficient than aircraft because they could be kept up during the entire transatlantic voyage of the convoy. Convoy duty was uh, long and, uh, and boring, really. Uh, you had to stay diligent. You met them at dawn, wherever your assignment was, and you stayed with them until dark. The mainstay of the U.S. blimp fleet was the K-class dirigibles. Of the 168 blimps launched by the Navy during the war, 134 were K-ships. The K-types were the only airships that were actually used in wartime patrol. We had a 50 caliber machine gun four and a 30 caliber aft, and uh, we carried four Mark VII depth charges. They were 550-pound depth charges. Blimps would search for enemy submarines using magnetic airborne detectors known as MAD, or MAD gear. MAD gear would pick up any bulk mass, and um, many times it picked up schools of fish and um, many of us bombed schools of fish. <laughs> MAD was most effective the closer you got to the surface of the water. So it was a rather dangerous to be flying that kind of patrol. It was standard procedure on lighter than air to carry a knife on your belt. The knife on your belt was intended to, should they crash, cut your way through the bag to get yourself out of there because the helium is like water and you can't breathe it. And you'll drown in helium. If they sighted a submarine, they themselves were so slow that they could only marginally bring an attack against the submarine. 
Here, manned aircraft, either land-based or aboard carriers, were much more efficient. While many have questioned the true value of airships in combat, the fact remains that during World War II, not a single vessel was lost to enemy submarines while a convoy was escorted by airships. As tensions escalated during the Cold War, the United States recognized the need for large airships to patrol North America, guarding against a surprise nuclear attack. There was a whole new interest in non-rigid airships to use as radar platforms. Because here you could take a radar up several thousand feet, and the radar carried in the airship could provide early warning of enemy surface ships or enemy aircraft approaching. A new series of non-rigid blimps called the ZPG class were delivered in 1952. The ZPG blimps were fitted with three onboard radar systems and a large radar dome beneath the gondola. Nearly 100 feet longer than the World War II K-class dirigibles, the airships carried almost one million cubic feet of helium and cruised at 80 miles per hour. We built a few of them, operated them until the 1960s, and then just the cost of development, the cost of special handling facilities, and the cost of actually constructing and operating the airships was just too great, and the airship program died. By 1962, the last U.S. Navy blimp was deflated, decommissioned, and uh, there were, at that time, then two blimps left in the whole world, the one Goodyear and one small advertising blimp left in Germany. And uh, that was the lowest number of airships in the skies in this century. The airship program was resurrected by the Navy in the 1980s when Secretary of the Navy John Lehman wanted to look into the feasibility of radar picket airships to support fleet operations. Today, the Sentinel-1000 is the largest lighter-than-aircraft in the world at 222 feet long and a gas capacity of over 350,000 cubic feet. With enormous lifting power and extremely low fuel consumption, the Sentinel-1000 can remain aloft without refueling for more than 24 hours. The United States Navy envisions a primary role as a long endurance platform for airborne radar to counter high-speed cruise missiles. An advantage of the airship over its fixed wing counterparts is the ability to carry large and unusually shaped antennas inside the gas bag. Housed internally, these antennas do not interfere with the aerodynamics of the aircraft. Powered by twin diesel engines generating 2,400 horsepower, the Sentinel achieves a top speed of over 60 knots. For takeoff, the airship needs only a surface area with a radius of 300 feet. The airship is surprisingly durable if hit by enemy fire. The shape of the blimp is maintained with very low internal pressure, so if punctured, the gas does not escape rapidly. A one-foot hole in the bag results in the loss of less than 10% of the airship's helium during the first hour. Many feel the role of the airship can be better accomplished with reconnaissance satellites. But with the launch of the Sentinel-1000, proponents hope the airship will once again regain a prominent place in the history of flight. The Navy's last blimp was decommissioned in 1962, and the rigid airship saw its end with the dawn of the Second World War. But somewhere below the cold waves of Point Sara, California, lies the wreck of the USS Macon. With it are the last artifacts of a vanished era of aviation history. In the late 80s, members of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, known as Mabari, found a fragment of the Macon which had been residing literally under their noses. We were looking for more clues as to where uh, we might be able to find the Macon's location. We had a piece of girder structure that a fisherman brought up. Uh, we were able to locate the fisherman, and he provided us an, with enough uh, information that we could, uh, that led to a successful dive with the U.S. Navy in 1990. The Seacliff crew were able to find the, the, the main debris field 
pretty much as advertised within about 10 minutes. So I was very relieved that everything went so well. It was very exciting. With this tantalizing discovery, events quickened. A more thorough effort was mounted through the Institute and their research vessel headed out to sea. A robotic submersible known as an ROV was sent over the side. Within minutes, it came to rest in 1,500 feet of water. Before it spread the wreck of America's last airship. We were able to, to map out a likely scenario of how the airship broke up. It appears that maybe it broke up into, into thirds as it, uh, as it went down, and then maybe the tail section was actually um, not in the two fields that we'd found. Years in salt water have taken their toll of the airship's delicate framework, yet many recognizable pieces of the Macon remain, scattered across the ocean floor like some huge broken toy. The airship's docking nose cone used to moor it to the mast at Moffett Field is now a rusting hulk. carcasses of the huge Maybach engines once powering the Macon at over 80 knots now sit silent, filled with silt and seawater. A jumble of dishes from the galley once feeding hungry airshipmen are now picked clean by deep sea scavengers. burst fuel tank, others of which were thrown overboard in 1935 in desperate efforts to keep the airship buoyant in its last moments, are now a haven for shy fish. The door to the control car laying flat, surrounded by wire, cabinets, and other tools of command, all lie undisturbed. While the airship itself has long since broken up, leaving only fragments, the Sparrowhawk fighters are surprisingly intact. Resting on the bottom in their hangared configuration, they aim useless gun sights at opponents that long ago passed into history. The cockpits, filled with silt now, still display their rudimentary instrumentation. Saltwater has attacked the aircraft hulks, long ago stripped of their covering fabric. Yet on one wing, the insignia can still be seen. One last solitary sparrow hawk resides in the Museum of Naval Aviation. But these planes will stay where they are, never again to see the skies in which they once flew. They will remain here with the Macon as monuments to men lost and a war fought and won without them. Today, the big hangar at Moffett Field in Sunnyvale still waits, doors ajar, for the return of the ship for which it was built. The airships will not return, but they were a gracious and once visionary piece of aviation history.